Good morning. It is Sunday and we are back cooking with Kave. And today I'm going to tell you all my secrets on how I make baklava and burek because we're not yet ready to open Kave Cafe. We're closer than we were before, but we're not there yet. So I figure you guys can learn how to make all this good stuff at home. So today we've got, we're going to make um, walnut baklava, just traditional. And once you get the basics of how to do that, then you can mix and match and add whatever you want in to make your own kind of punked out baklava, whether or not it's dried fruit or chocolate or M&Ms or candy corns. You can totally rock the socks off of it on your own once you have the basic technique and tools down. And then we're going to make burek and burek for people who don't know what burek is. I lovingly call it baklava savory sister and because it's filled with meats and cheeses and stuff like that. Now, first off, let's go through some of the ingredients that um, were on the list that were on my page earlier in the week. And first off, this is the, the phyllo dough. This is my favorite, absolute favorite phyllo dough because it is the most consistent as far as not being shitty and being all stuck together. And it gives me the same amount of sheets every time. You wouldn't think that this would be an issue, but it's an issue with other brands. And the other thing is we're using the burek dough. Now I want you to notice, see there's a number nine here. That's a nine inch thick. And then if you look, where's my number four here? It says something. This is a number four, but this doesn't say that it's a number four. Somewhere it should, but it doesn't. So if you look somewhere on the box of phyllo dough and burek dough, you'll see a number four or you'll see a number nine. So when you're working with savory stuff, you always want to do thicker because then all of your stuff doesn't all like bust through because this is, is very thin like a sheet of paper. This is not. I personally like this phyllo dough because, again, it's – let's put it right side up. It's more consistent. I get the same amount of dough in each box. Again, who knew that in the 21st century that this would be an issue of consistency with phyllo dough, but it is. And the other thing is they're always the right size. Again, sometimes you'll get some of these phyllo dough packages or burek dough packages, and um, they're wonky. Like one sheet might be a little lopsided. One is little, like, has a ragged edge. You know, they all slant one way. So there's no consistency. These are the two brands, again, that I use all the time. So, in my instructions that my lovely social media team put up there, it asked that you make the syrup ahead of time. So, one thing with baklava is you can't just make the syrup the same day you make the baklava because the syrup needs to be cold. So, there's this kind of you need a hot baklava and cold syrup or cold baklava and hot syrup. I don't like, personally the cold baklava and hot syrup because hot syrup hasn't had the chance to cool down and like stiffen up. So I always prefer to at least do the, the cold syrup and hot baklava. I feel that it penetrates better and there's less chance of it being soggy because even if the baklava is dry and cool and you put a hot baklava, there is a, like a small percentage chance that that hot baklava could just wipe out all of your work and make your baklava soggy. And there is nothing worse then going through all that work and going, oh shit, that really sucks. And now you have to dump the whole thing out because it's soggy. It's very disappointing. So that's kind of my thing. And if you've watched my stuff before and we have feta cheese, I should probably put my comments on so I can see if anybody has any questions. So we're gonna do a feta cheese um, barrack. And then we also have some, some ground meat that we're going to cook up for, we're going to learn how to do the individual spirals and then one spiral in um, a pie dish. So I've got um, feta, I've got parsley, mint, and green onions. I'm supposed to get dill. I forgot that. So if you have dill, you can chop that up. We'll get to that later. Um, I've got meat and one onion we're going to chop up. And I've got some butter and I've got some eggs and we're all going to have some fun playing with all this stuff. First off, I want to you to take your feta cheese because you need to drain 
all the brine out of your feta and it needs to soak in some water. So whenever you're doing something with feta cheese, let's do this over the sink so I don't make a mess. Uh, you always need to kind of soak your feta to kind of reduce the saltiness. So first off, we're going to get that going. So that can just sit there while we do everything else. Next, I'm going to go turn on my ovens. Now, hold on a second. I have to get things in the oven and take out. All right. I have two ovens. I have a top oven and I have a bottom oven. FYI, don't ever put a baklava in your tiny top oven. It will never puff. So for today, I'm going to put the baklava on the bottom oven, and I'm going to heat up the top oven for the brick. So that's kind of how we're going to do that today. So both are going to get put at 350, so that can warm up. There's one. That's two. All right. We're doing prep work right now so that everything can all come together at the same time. Next, I want you to get your pot. So I just have a pot, it's probably bigger than I need. And you wanna take three sticks of butter because we're gonna get the, the butter for the, the baklava slowly melting. If you let the butter slowly melt, then you don't get the break apart with the milk deposits as bad. So what happens, you know, normally when you make baklava over in Turkey, they um, they clarify the butter, and so there's no milk fats on it. Milk fat, um, if you get too much milk fat on the top, then it overbrowns and it looks really sad and messy. So because I don't have the time or the inclination to strain off the milk fats, because that's a time consuming process, I just let this slowly melt. So then it's all even and consistent. And then you don't get the separation because the hotter the butter gets, then you get more of the separation between the butter and the milk fats. So I'm gonna take my butter, put it in my pan, and I'm just gonna stick it on low. So that's just gonna slowly melt over there. So that's done for right now, got that done. And then what we're going to do is we are going to get our meat filling cooked up for the barrack so that it can cool so that once we're ready to roll it, it'll be cool enough for us to be able to roll it. Because if you have a hot filling that goes into the cold dough, it's going to make it soggy and it's going to stick together and you're not going to be able to roll it. So it makes for a very grumpy morning and we don't want grumpy mornings. So I'm going to get my cutting board. I've got my onion, I need a knife, and we're just going to dice up, oh, I should turn off my pan, pan for browning up some diced onions and meat. How's that? Let's turn that on to a medium to kind of get that hot, and I'm just going to chop some of this up. So we're just going to dice it. I am not a very OCD kind of cutting of onion kind of person. I am not fantastic at it, and I know that that is not my strength, but that is completely okay. You can cut the onion as big or as small as you want. I am not picky. It's just pretty much gonna get diced with the, the ground beef and the onion. Um, my I learned how to make baklava from my mom. So my mom is American, for people who don't know, my mom's American. And she married my dad in the late 60s. And she's from Rhode Island uh, with an English and Scotch background. So understand her, her food choices were meat, potatoes, carrots, and peas. And then in the late 60s, after graduate school, she moved with a backpack down to southeastern Turkey to marry my dad to a little town called Adana, which is where the American Air Force Base is. And while she was there, she decided she was going to make it her mission to learn how to make baklava because, you know, she had time. She was surrounded by all different kinds of people and books and could get the help that she wanted. And so she kind of hodgepodge a few different recipes together and then came up with the recipe that we've been using. So normally... Baklava is a very labor-intensive process. Over in Turkey, some people still roll out their own dough, or if you literally translate it, it's called opening the dough because you're using the roller or the oklava to open the dough. So that's literally the trans 
Grumpy mornings. Yes, we don't like grumpy mornings, Angie. So um, one of the things mom, you know, learned was, you know, you butter every single sheet of the phyllo dough. You butter the pan, you butter every sheet. It takes like 45 minutes. And that's how, you know, I grew up learning how to do it. And then I decided I wanted to sell it. And this was way back in 2004. And, you know, I am not a really patient person. And, you know, I decided I needed to come up with a better way. And um, so I started to do every two sheets, right? So I started to cut every two, I would uh, butter every two sheets of the filo dough. And I remember mom at that time coming into the kitchen while I was cooking. She was like, oh my God, you're not buttering every sheet of dough. You're only doing every two. Like, this is not my recipe. And I'm like, mom, nobody has figured out the difference yet. So I'm going to go with it. Right. And she's like, I can't be in this kitchen. I just can't because it was physically uncomfortable for her to be in the kitchen while I was doing every two sheets. Now imagine how mom was when I'm like, mom, I figured out how to do it even better and faster. And she's like, oh my God, like, what are you doing? And I said, well, I said, uh, I, someone asked me like, how do big companies, you know, and factories make baklava? Like, do they butter every sheet? And I'm like, I don't know. So I YouTubed it because, you know, YouTube is like Uncle Google. It knows the answers to everything. So I YouTubed it and I found a factory that uh, had their whole process of, let's turn you so that I'm not talking. So it had the whole process from beginning to end of how they make the dough and how they had you know, different rooms for different things. This is where they made the dough. And then after it chilled, it moved to the rolling out room. And then it moved to the assembly room, right? And so I'm watching, I'm watching. And then I get to the point where they're assembling the baklava. And literally, my jaw hit the ground. You know those cartoons with, like, Wile E. Coyote? And he's looking at something, and he sees, like, something like, oh, my God, I can't believe this coming at him. That's going to hit him in the face. And that cartoon image of, like, jaw dropping to the ground, that's kind of what I did. Because what they did is they assembled it dry. Can you believe it? I'm like, holy shit, if I can assemble this dry, then this saves me, like, a gazillion amount of minutes. So what they do, I'm just going to get my onions in my pan and cooking. We'll let that sit for a minute while I tell my story because I get squirreled. So what they did is they had their pan and they had big, huge pans and they had all of their phyllo dough pre-counted and rolled around, around a big dowel. And after every section of that pre-counted sheets for the different layers, they had a piece of plastic wrap. And they did that again. So they'd have, let's say, four sheets of phyllo dough, plastic wrap, four sheets of phyllo dough, plastic wrap. And they had that kind of, you know, organization. So they have their, their pan, right, on their thing. And there's two people on either side and a third one in the middle that would pull off the plastic wrap, grab the dough, and it would go clunk on the ground. And then they take their dried nuts and they go, crunk, you know, sprinkle, 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 and they pull off another plastic wrap and it would go like this. And they do that until they had the right amount of layers with the right amount of dough. And I was like, are you freaking kidding me? They assemble this all dry and then they cut it dry. Because if you've ever tried to cut phyllo dough when it's wet or with it, tons of butter, it all sticks to the side of the knife, and you're just, oh, you gotta go slow because you don't wanna tear it. It's a pain in the freaking ass. So um, when the, you're cutting baklava dough when it's dry, oh my God, it is like night and day. And then what they do, and my friend, I'm not gonna say how I describe the big vat of butter, but well, maybe I will. So like my friend always laughs at me because I love children, but in order to get the amount, like the concept of the size of this pot of butter that they melt, I say, well, it's a big pot of butter that you could probably cook a child in. I know that's not very politically correct, but you can get the amount, like the bigger size of the pot, right? So they have this massive amount of butter in this pot and they have like a soup ladle, right? And they pull their baklava over and they take the soup ladle 
and they do this flip of their hand and whoosh, the butter splashes down and they do this and I'm thinking, oh, how no am I doing that? Because I don't have anybody to clean up all of that splattered butter. So I need to come up with a better way. So trial and error, I tried to melt it in the pot and I tried to pour it over the top, but it all glops out into one thing, don't do that. And then I said, all right, I'm gonna get a bigger Turkish coffee pot that has a lip so that I can be more focused. And then I'm going to um, pour it with the Turkish coffee pot. That didn't work because I get all the milk fat on top and then one part would be all brown and the other part would be all cooked. It was very frustrating. So this is where my magic wand comes in. It is called a turkey baster. This was revolutionary. This is how I can do 13 trays of baklava in one day and how I can do five trays of baklava in about the time it takes to cook one tray of baklava. So five trays in about 35 minutes. It's pretty freaking amazing when it would normally take 45 minutes to brush every single. So if you think there's 26, 27 sheets of dough in your package and you're taking a minute to brush and layer and brush and layer, I don't have time for that. So this revolutionary, absolutely. So this is my magic wand. This is my secret for crazy fast, quick baklava. And the other thing that I realized once I started doing the assembling it dry and cutting it and pouring the button and doing the butter on top after was that I don't know what the whole cooking magic is. I don't know the science behind it, but when you pour the butter over the dry baklava that's already been cut into the pieces, as it cooks, it cooks up and you get those nice little domes that you see in all of the prepackaged baklava that you see in the commercial setting. Like, how do I freaking get all those domes? Because I'm buttering all of the sheets. How do they get all of those domes? Because when you butter every sheet, it doesn't have that lift. For some reason, I'm sure there is some sort of scientific cooking reason for why that all happens. It allows the air in or whatever, I don't know. But when you, when you do the butter on the top and put it in the oven, it, there's something that creates that lift. So you get more of those uniform top domes that you see when you get the prepackaged, commercially made baklava. So I learned their secret. All right, my onions are softening. We're going to move on to putting my meat in. Now, we're not probably going to use all the meat, and I'm sure you can find another way to use it, or you can go back to my other video on how to make a lemon with the flat stuffed flatbread, and you can use all the extra in that. So I'm just going to put the rest of my ground meat in with the onions, and then I'm just going to take some salt and some pepper, and then... I have this roasted paprika that I actually have now from Turkey. Hold on, we're gonna um, get a spoon and I'm gonna show you what it looks like because it's purple and we love purple. So that is Isot. Now Isot is from Southeastern Turkey from the region of Gaziantep and Urfa and it's spicy, but the nice thing about it, it's a slow heat. So this is a roasted paprika and sometimes they put them on the roofs of their terracotta roofs to kind of dry out but um the lovely thing about this is that unlike red pepper that hits you at the front of the mouth this pepper hits you at the back of your mouth so but it's a slow burn it's not a hot hot intense but it really has this gentle heat that goes down your with the flavors of the food it doesn't overpower the flavor so i like to put okay this is my teaspoon this is just a regular like whatever silverware coffee spoon thing that's my measurement and I put that in there. And we're gonna cook this up. And then once that's cooked, we'll move on, we'll let it cool and we'll move on to the baklava. You guys have any questions right now? We're doing okay? All right. So I guess while that's cooking down, I'm gonna talk a little bit about different kinds of nuts with the baklava. So traditionally, okay, come on. There you go, you just sit for a minute. Traditionally, baklava in Turkey is three different kinds depending on the region of Turkey that you're in. So up by the Black Sea region, they use predominantly roasted hazelnuts. 
you know, in Istanbul, it's walnuts with some pistachios and Southern because in Gaziantep, they're known for their pistachios that um, the, the, the predominance of baklava down in Southeastern Turkey is pistachio. Now, baklava has been, you know, in its form of baklava as an entity since about the 16th, 17th century. There's always been in the Turkic culture in, in that region, because most of them were nomads, this um, uh, flatbread, nuts, dried fruit and cheese kind of folding in of things like little pockets because they were nomads. So they would always make these flatbreads and they put some like really, really thin and they'd roll up cheese and nuts. Um, there are writings going back to the Assyrians. There's all like from the 11th century about flatbread and nuts that they put in their horse's pocket so that they would have something to eat as they were traveling. It wasn't until about, I think it was the 16th or 17th century where the the Ottoman Sultan, I don't remember which Sultan it was, wanted to reward his Janissaries, which was his army, for um, I think after Ramadan. And he went to his kitchen and said, can you create something for to celebrate the Janissaries and all their their hard work, you know, being in the military. So the kitchen in Topkapa Palace decided, all right, let's come up with something. And so they came up with this version that we call baklava. And um, baklava used to come out just at the end of Ramadan, and the Janissaries would come and they would get their big tray of baklava and they bring it back to their bag. So I mean a big tray. It's like a massive, big, huge round tray that they would, you know, some people would, it would take two people to carry because they would just make a big batch. And then once they were done with their, their big metal tray, then they would bring the metal tray and they would deposit it by the kitchen again. So this is how baklava kind of got into the everyday. And it was a treat for the wealthy and for the palace. And it wasn't until like the late 18th century that the first um, pastry shop started to sell baklava in, um, in Istanbul. So the first baklava shop, you know, for the baklava that we know it, opened up in Istanbul in, in like 18 something or no, 17 something. And then it grew and grew and grew. And then of course we know how Turkish coffee grew. So like the combination of the Turkish coffee and the sweet, you know, that all, that just created this whole kind of coffee and treat and cafe experience. So I know that there's a lot of different regional ways of doing baklava. And it really kind of depends on the country and the region because, you know, the Ottomans, they ruled that whole area for hundreds of years so and people were trading and coming into Constantinople all the time for spices because the spice bazaar was was a hub and so it, they brought different flavors and different baklava back to their region so if you go around that area you're going to see variations of baklava and um, not all baklava is the same so if you go to Iran you might have um, rose water syrup and maybe you have almonds if you go to Greece they're going to use a honey syrup and they're going to use walnuts. If you go, you know, Armenian, from what I read, sometimes they'd serve it dry in like a wedge and you pour the honey over it. So everybody has their own way and version of doing baklava. And I think that's what lends baklava to being a very creative palette for all different kinds of flavors. So when I started to do baklava years ago, and then I went through the banking on women program and I did my market research, I realized that there's like eight people. Now this is understanding. This is six years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, there were eight people in the Valley in the Salt Lake Valley making and selling baklava. Now the industry has boomed. And in the last year there's three or four new people. So now if you think about it in a hundred mile radius in Salt Lake city from the center, we have a hundred miles, we have probably about 10 to 12 baklava bakers 
that are focusing on baklava to do their own business of some sort. And they're doing their own regional thing. Sometimes they add a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So when I went through my market research, I said, well, what makes me different? And what makes me different is the fact that I don't always play to the rules that baklava needs to be just this nut. That's it. Walnuts, pistachios, hazelnuts. That's it. We don't do anything else. Or it's not baklava. Like, I don't agree with that. So then I started adding different flavors. So you start adding chocolate, or maybe you mix up nuts, or maybe you add um, cranberries, maybe you add marzipan. All right, my, my meat is done. So I'm just gonna let that cool. I'm gonna turn that off. All right, we're gonna get to our box. And I'm gonna talk as I do this, because apparently I can talk a lot. Sometimes maybe I have something valuable to say. Maybe sometimes it's just a jumbled rambling. I don't know. We're just going to keep going. So I started with experimenting with different nuts and different flavors and taking different challenges. So I like to mix and match flavors. So basically, your basic baklava recipe is about three cups of a nut. So I've already measured out three cups of walnuts, and I put that in. And again, I've modified mom's recipe. She used to have a half a cup of sugar and I just use a quarter cup of sugar. So I just put in, I figured there's enough sugar going on in the syrup that I don't need to add any more on the inside. But as a variation, if I wanna add color to my baklava and wanna make it blue or pink or something like that, I may not use the walnuts, I might use cashews or macadamia nuts, I might go to the baking store, and I might get electric blue sanding sugar that you use for sprinkles for cookies, and I might put that in. Because what the sanding sugar does when it gets ground up and baked is that those colors create this little popping, almost like starburst kind of things in the phyllo dough when you cut it, so you'll see these little bits of blue flecks in the phyllo dough. These things make me happy. These little, like, fun little, like, oh, my God, there's freaking blue in my baklava. Like, there doesn't take a lot to make me goofy. All right, cinnamon. I don't put a lot of spices. I do sugar, and I do cinnamon, unless I'm doing something else. One time back in the 90s, I think it was, like, 94, I was at college, and I was living off campus at the time, and I remember... There was the um, television show, the local news, and they came on and says, we're looking for a contest for all the baklava bakers to, you know, come to this Greek festival and see who goes away with the best baklava in Rhode Island. I think this was 1994. I call my mom up. I say, mom, you got to enter this contest because you have the best freaking baklava. Like, what am I supposed to do? I'm just this tiny little white woman. She's got little white hair and I'm American. What can I do? I can't. I'm like, mom, you've got to bring your baklava. It gets a Greek festival and we make Turkish baklava. I don't know. My mom pretends to be shy. She's really not shy. So she goes with her baklava and she sits down and this like very fancy chef comes by and, you know, he tells her like, oh, what's in this? Is there clove? Is there this? And my mom's like, Cinnamon and sugar? And he's like, really? That's it? Because there's so much flavor, blah, 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 blah. And she's competing about all these Greek festivals, all these Greek bakers and all that other stuff in this tiny little tray. And she won. So in 1994, Mom's Baklava won the best baklava in Rhode Island at a Greek festival. So that was pretty funny. She was so excited. All right, I'm going to turn this on. It's going to be loud. Hold on, I guess, yes. Thank you. Insert elevator music here. All right. One thing that I like to do with my baklava is I like to grind my, I don't know, can you see? I don't want to make a mess because then it gets, but I like finer nuts in my in my filling than chunky nuts. That's just my preference. I think it goes back to I don't like walnuts in my brownies. Like I don't like the texture of a cooked walnut, like that hard but it's cooked so now it's soft kind of thing. So I have a tendency to grind my nuts. And if people ask me, well why do you grind your nuts so fine? My answer is usually like I don't want the nuts to overpower the piece 
of baklava. In my opinion, when you have a good piece of baklava, you have three different like flavor sections or texture sections in one bite. So you've got the crunch of the top. So you crunch the phyllo dough and you get that like satisfaction and then you move into the nuts in the middle where the nut, nuts and the goo and the dough you know so you get the nuts blended in softly and then the bottom you get the gooey caramelized kind of like chewiness so those are the three flavor textures that i like to have when i do baklava so i don't want the nut to overpower everything and if i'm putting other flavors and other things, I try to put it in with the dough so it all kind of evenly distributes, unless I specifically want it to show like maybe mini M&Ms or something like that because I want the color and I want the surprise of the mini M&Ms. All right, so now we've got that. And we're going to open up our dough. So I'm going to kind of, so that you can see how I do this, I am going to move things. This is the knife that I like because I can go straight down. So any knife will will be fine. I just like the, I guess, what is it, a meat cleaver? I don't know knives. But I like this because I can just push it straight down and it'll make a straight line. I personally don't do well with cutting this way because then I end up pulling the phyllo dough and I get really annoyed and irritated with myself. I do a lot of swearing and cuss words because I'm pulling it and it's messy and that makes me angry. So this makes it easier to control the dough because it has a flat edge. Um, the other thing that I need is I need a scissors because I don't fold my baklava. I cut the extra off because, again, I'm trying to be as efficient with my time as possible. Mom used to spend a lot of time taking the baklava and folding in the edges and making sure that it was flat. And I'm just like, no, one, you get um, thicker edges all the way around than in the middle. So you end up with more like phyllo on the sides and it makes it, you know, kind of extra crispy and not, not with any dough really because you have those extra layers of um, phyllo dough. So I just want everything to be even. The other reason why I like this dough is that, um, okay, hold on a second. How am I going to do this? Let's move this. Welcome to a tiny home. Okay. The other reason why I like this is that the plastic that covers the baklava is just as long as the actual dough. So you already have a surface. Let's move that there. Oi, I need more room. I wish I could do go go gadget cabinet extension, but that does not work. All right. There are going to be times where you're going to have beautiful dough where the stars align and you think angels are singing. And then there's going to be times where you feel like the devil has come into your dough and made it all crispy and cracky just to make you grumpy and screw with you. This is actually one of those angel singing times because it's soft and it's pliable. Now, what did I do with my scissors? People, you got to watch what I'm doing. So that I don't lose things because I get squirreled. All right. So what we're going to do, so that with, I don't know if it's two fingers for you, but it's two fingers for me. We're going to measure that. And we're going to cut that off the long side, so the horizontal. So I'm going to cut down because this dough is too wide for my pan. So I cut this down. See? I cut off the side. And I like to save this. I, I become a little bit obsessive and um, I end up with lots of little baggies with all of these things because I can't throw these away because you can wrap, you know, asparagus with them. You can just cook them and create like phyllo dough crumbles. I don't know. This is my OCD. I cannot throw this little bit of phyllo dough away. So if you're going to save it, put it in a Ziploc bag or put it back in the plastic bag, little container that it came with and save it. All right, you ready to assemble a baklava in five minutes? We've got our dough. We've got our um, our nuts. So we're going to count off four sheets. Two, three, four. All right, so mine's a little bit stuck. Now, please do not be afraid of phyllo dough because phyllo dough is your friend. Okay, we took four sheets. We put it in the bottom of our pan. Okay, let's just, you guys can see that, okay? 
Meat cleaver. Yes, John, it's a meat cleaver. Okay, since I don't usually cleave meat, I don't usually know what a meat cleaver is. All right, so now I do this really scientific way of measuring how much nuts. I kind of go one, two, three, and I swoosh it. I know. It's very scientific, and I just kind of make sure that it's even. And it's not going to cover the whole thing, but you don't want it to. You want it to kind of blend in, you know. And I get it as much as I need to. I try to get it into the corners because sometimes those corners, they get a little tricky. And then we do it again. So we get four sheets. One, two, three. Oh, mine's a little stuck. It's all good. Because you can always patch it and peel it off later. Okay. You, no one will ever know that there's a piece ripped. And I do my scientific swishing met method. One, two, three. It's like three handfuls-ish. Does that make sense? I think if you want to get technical, it's probably like a third of a cup or something like that. Or I, I don't know, two-thirds of a cup. I haven't measured it. You know, that's kind of not the Turkish way to, like, measure things. So I kind of go with the flow. Okay, we've got our last thing of nuts. One, two, three, four. See, it's breaking. It's okay. You're not going to know that it's broken. You just kind of put it in and you flatten it out. See, you can't tell that that was split. I have some extra nuts left over, so I can save those. You kind of wing it to see how much nuts you want. And if you feel like you kind of ground up too much, then you save it. If you want to add more, then you can add more. Baklava is a beautiful way to express your creativity. This is how I do it, you know. And then we finish it off and we take this big rest of the phyllo dough that's already breaking and sticking. Right? We put that on top. Okay, you've assembled it. Ta-da. Now we gotta keep our meat cleaver. So we got our meat cleaver. So I'm gonna go this way. I'm gonna move my cheese. Remove, all right. There we go. All right. We can see. I always, so mine, my baklava I do bite sized pieces. So I'm going to show you one half is going to be bite sized pieces and one half is going to be like the traditional kind of two inch pieces. And then you can pick and choose which kind you want to do. I don't like to do the diamond shapes. I don't like to do Again, for people who know me, I don't like waste. And if I can't make it consistently the same size, then that's waste and I can't sell that. So I uh, go down the middle, start in the middle, and you go all the way down. Now I go six rows across this way. They're about an inch and I go all the way across. And then I pick it up. One, two, three, four, and that will be five and six. And then you pick up each of the rows and you go down. And then because my brain is incapable of cutting to the left, after I do this, I turn my pan around. It, I don't know, my brain is weird and it, it hurts my brain and I just turn it. All right, so this is the if you're going to make bite size. Right. If you want to do traditional size, you cut it in half and then you cut this big piece in half again. And then you cut this piece in half again. So I guess you go four across. OK, so that's the setup for that. And now we're going to go down and we're going to do the other side. So we're going to go down the middle again for all of it. And again, I turn things. It makes it easier on my brain. Okay. Now for the bite size pieces, we're going to go four across. So I do my top row first. Making sure that you don't go into the other one because we're going to do something different. And again, I turn it. My brain hurts. Don't judge me. All right, so now we've got our small pieces done. Can you see that? 
Now we're going to go to our bigger pieces. And this way we're going to do it in a third. Okay. All right. There you go. So that took me, what, five minutes? Okay. Are you ready? Where's my... I've got my melted dough. And if you can, if your dough is slowly melted, then your milk fat is on the bottom and your butter is on the top because the milk is heavier than the butter. I stick my turkey baster. Now what you can't just pull it right out. It will blop and it will squirt butter and it'll make you really, really grumpy. Okay. So you take it out gradually and then you just kind of, okay, take it out gradually. And I always go around the edges first. And you just kind of make sure that all of your baklava is covered. And the butter is going to seep down as it cooks. Isn't this so easy? Baklava doesn't need to be intimidating, right? See? Do you see how fast that came together? Ta da! Because there's just butter left over, I'm just gonna pour the rest on there. That's done. So now, this goes in your bottom oven, if you were main oven, okay? And this is gonna cook until it's brown. So about 30 ish minutes. All right, it's done. See? Look at that. We did baklava in like all of this stuff in like 20 minutes and it's done. All right, so now we're gonna get rid of this because we don't need that anymore. And we are going to get our fillings ready for the, um, the barrack. Okay, we already have our filling ready for the meat ones, which are gonna be the individual spiraled ones. So let's take our meat and put it in here. There we go. Okay. I'm going to slide this under. Let's see if I can do this without messing up my little thing. I had to put a big, huge cutting board on my sink so I had enough room to show everybody. All right, I got my meat, that's done. You have your feta cheese has been soaking in the water, so we're gonna drain that. Okay. Let's see, and we're gonna put it in here. And crumble it. There we go. All right. Okay, let's put this aside and we are going to cut up. We've got some green onions. Now, normally the cheese barrack usually just has um, feta and parsley, but again, I don't always follow the rules. I remember one time in college and I was making, um, wait a minute. I was making barrack and I decided I was going to put sliced tomatoes. So I made the barrack in a pan and cut it like the, like baklava triangles, but bigger, like baklava squares, but bigger. And my dad visited me in my um, campus apartment because my dad and I went to the same school. He was a professor. So he'd pop over sometimes after classes. He's like, oh, do you have anything, you know, to munch on for lunch? And I said, well, I have some barrack. And he's like, okay, I'll have that. And he had a piece of like, this has tomatoes in it. I go, yeah, because I really like the flavor of tomatoes and burrack. And he's like, we don't put sliced tomatoes in burrack. And I go, why not? And he's like, but that's not, burrack is three kinds. You have feta and parsley, you have a ground meat and onion, and you have spinach and onion. You don't mix them. And I'm like, but why not? Oh, and he would get so frustrated because, you know, I'd always try these different new things. So like the baklava, this is not baklava. You're adding too many flavors. 
who is your demographic? And I said, not you, I have millennials, but the traditionalists are probably not going to eat my baklava, and I'm okay with that. So anyway, I tend to add more things to my barek than probably everybody else. So I've decided to add green onions, I've decided to add mint, so I've decided to add all this other stuff. I need my big piece of parsley. What do I do with my mint? Okay. So I'm just kind of shaving off the tops of the parsley because I don't need a crazy amount and I don't want to spend a gazillion amount of time picking off all of the stems because the stems feel like sticks in your mouth when you eat that. You would think that it would cook down, but it does not. It still tastes like sticks in your mouth. These little stems, not so fun to eat. They kind of get stuck in your teeth. So I'm just going to, the thing with the parsley in the barrette is that it's never fully chopped into fine bits. It's just kind of chopped and you'll see big, you know, flakes or leaves or what do they call little bits of parsley. Something like that. So I'm going to put that there. And let's see, my mint is somewhere else, so we're going to skip that because we're going to move on. Um, anyway, I guess we're just going to go do this because I don't know what happened to my mint. And we're just going to kind of toss this all together so it kind of lightly minces, mixes together. You can add whatever herbs that you want. I personally like mint and I like dill and I like green onions. I like to have a little bit of crunch and I like parsley. All right, are you ready? We're gonna do, we're gonna get ready and do some barrack. So, um, that box of filo dough is going to be, I mean, the, the barrack dough is gonna be, there's more sheets than what's going to roll and spiral in here. So what I thought is we will do the cheese one in here and spiral this up and make it all nice and stick that in the top oven. And then we'll learn how to make the individual ones, how to make the little individual roses and put it on a pan and put that in the oven for the meat ones. Sound good? Quick baklava is amazing. Yes, it takes very long. But see, now you have shortcuts, right? Shortcuts are good, and it doesn't sacrifice the flavor. And it's what they do in the factory. So it's got to be the right thing, right? All right. What am I doing? What am I doing? I lost my – I got all squirrels, people. All right. We're going to get this out. This is going to be a little bit thicker. Let's get our dough out. Oh, it's stuck in my box. See, it was stuck. It pulled off the bottom. First, we're going to get our eggs and some milk going in our little container because we're going to brush the, the dough. So this is going to be a little bit more labor intensive. So I've got some milk. And I'm going to take a couple of eggs. If you don't have milk, you can use yogurt. Again, Turkish food is not always about exact things or you can always substitute and find another way to do it right and barrack is an easy way for me to use up all of my chicken eggs i went through 32 of them with my brunch bats on friday and i still have a gazillion i have like eggs everywhere you know, I have eggs in my freezer, refrigerator, I got eggs on the counter over here, I got eggs in a bowl over there, because with my seven chickens, I get like seven, six to seven eggs a day. And, you know, when they're baby chicks, you don't realize how many eggs, you just think they're really cute and fluffy until they all grow up and they start laying, and then you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do with all these eggs? So you all know where to come if you need eggs, because I have them. All right, so we're going to put that there. We're going to put that there. What I'm going to do is I got my butter, and I'm going to butter the bottom of my pan. You can you can oil it if you want to, but I just like to to butter it just so that it doesn't stick. Okay, and now we're going to get started. It's not that hard. 
Guys, you gotta keep track of my scissors. Okay. All right, here we go. Can I buy some of your eggs? Dude, you can freaking have them. Since you live around the corner, I should just bring you a bunch. Miss Amber, that I just realized is my neighbor. All right, so if you're opening up your Barecto, you can tell the difference between the two. Let's lower this down so that you can see it. It's thicker and it's a different color. I don't know, can you tell? Like it's, I don't know, I guess it's too microscopic to really tell. All right, boy, my food process is in my way. Brush, handy dandy brush. And what you wanna do is you wanna brush. I learned the hard way, you gotta brush the whole thing. I can't take shortcuts with this as much as I would like to. I did try and it becomes really hard dough and it's not pliable if you don't brush the whole thing. So I have learned the hard way. Learn from my mistakes, okay? And put that aside. And then you take, whoops, you go along one edge, so the long edge. And again, where it can be anything you want. It can, you know, I give you permission to put whatever you want in it. You take that and you fold it over. You kind of tuck it. Then you roll it. When you get to the end, pull it back, right? Don't move it until you've added more moisture on top, okay? Because if you move this before you've added more moisture, it's going to split. It will probably split anyway. Again, things with this dough is very forgiving, okay? So to start off, I'm actually, because this is the center one, I don't want to roll that in there. It's going to be too hard. So I'm, let's see, let's move this here. No, not there, there. I'm going to roll it in while it's sitting where it is. It's stable. It's happy. See, I already split where it splits. Now I pull that other thing over so I don't tug it too much. Do you see? It's okay. It's split. All will be well. And you take that and then put that over there. And we're going to do this until we fill the pan. Okay? Actually, let me just add a little bit more. All right, how are you guys doing? Are you guys doing this? Do you have any questions? We're gonna be here for a minute. So yeah, I'm hoping that we can come up with some fun flavors that will be weekly specials at Cafe Cafe. I think the funnest fun that I did was to have um, some leftover, I had leftover feta cheese, I had leftover blueberries, I had some harissa, and I did this harissa with blueberries. Oh my goodness, that was kind of good. You know, the blueberries and the harissa, who would have thought that that actually would be a fun combination? And this can also be done with um, phyllo dough, like the regular baklava dough. And if you use regular baklava dough, it will make it, it will be more crispy because it's thinner. It will be a little bit more tricky to use, but it's thinner. All right, you ready? I'm gonna lift this up carefully. We get the escaped feta and we put it back in the pan. Again, it's okay if thing, and you start where you ended and then you wrap, okay? See, we wrapped another layer around. I'm gonna do it again. This particular phyllo dough does not dry out as fast as the other one because it's thicker. Maybe because it has more moisture and it's thicker, it does not dry out as much. And the reason why we're actually doing both baklava and barek today is because making this barek right now is kind of filling the time while the baklava cooks. Yes, I know. I can't wait for a barek cafe too. Like it's my favorite thing. Though I have to say as much as I enjoy making barek, I am still very scared to make su barek. Like I don't know if anybody knows what su barek is, but literally it freaks me out. I haven't done it yet because I feel like I'm going to kill it. So you would take this dough, this particular dough, and you have a pot of boiling hot water. And you take the dough and you submerge it in the boiling hot water. And then you pull it out and put it in cold water. 
and then you layer it. Oh my God, I can't tell you how stressful that would be because in my mind that would all break out, break apart and be an absolute mess in the boiling hot pan of water. But people do it all the time and survive over in Turkey, but I have yet to be brave enough to try it. I love it. It's so different. All right, here we go. Start on the other one and then wrap it around. And I'm going to add a little bit more egg mixture. And here we go. I think we have, what, two more we can probably do? You just boil it. You just boil it in the water. And, like, I've watched people do it, and I get so stressed. Like, my term for being stressed watching that thing is squidgy. I get all squidgy inside when they're about to put the big the dough in the boiling hot water. And then you pull it out, and I'm like, oh, my God, it's going to break every single time. It's kind of like, you know, those games when you were a kid that, like, pop. Or is it Connect Four or something like that? And you know that the pop is coming, and you jump every time. It's the same thing when I watch them put the dough. I always get squidgy and, and have a lot of anxiety. That's – I'll figure it out, but that is not for this year. I'm going to get the cafe up and running before that. All right. I personally like making burek this way with the spiral. I feel it has a little bit more flavor because you have all of the textures. Um, you can take this dough and you can do this in a pan, you know, just a regular tray. And if you're going to do it in a regular tray, then you need to um, you need to do all of this brushing in between the layers. And then once you've gone through half of the dough, then you would put your filling and then you would continue to put each layer with this egg and milk mixture in between. And you do it that way and you can cut it into bigger squares, like maybe like three inch squares. But that makes it easy. You know, if you have a big party and you just want to get it done or if you have leftovers and you don't have time to roll it. I just like this texture better when you put it all in the rolls. It's something that you don't really find over here. All right, here we go. It is too much stress for Burek. I wish someone would just make me Sue Burek so that I could just enjoy it because I can't enjoy it if I'm stressed making it. All right, I think this is the last one for this. And then we will have, we have about five or six left over for the meat. All right. This is the last one for here. All right, I'm put that in here, and I'm gonna squish that in. There we go. See? Isn't that pretty? All right, I'm gonna wipe my hand again because it's goopy. Hey, back there. Now, when you see something over in Turkey that have these little black seeds, they are. Um, Cherekoto or black caraway seeds. Let's pour some in here so you can see it. Let's put them here. They got a bit of a tang. They definitely look like seeds. If you're a gardener, they look like onion seeds. If you go to an Asian market, they're called black onion seeds, which we found out because we were cooking a recipe and it called for black onion seeds. And I didn't know that that's what these were. And then when we got the bag, I'm like, oh, I have a whole container of them. They're called cherekoto in Turkish. They're called black caraway seeds in the Mediterranean markets. And another name of them is black cumin. So I, I don't know which is right, but that's if you're looking for it, that's what these are. And if you see these on any pastries over in Turkey, it usually means there's feta cheese inside. I don't know who figured out that cherekoto and feta cheese products, they work really well together, but... This is how you know that there's feta cheese inside of something. It's kind of like your telltale thing. Because my daughter loves extra, I put a little extra. Ta-da, that's it, that's gonna go in the oven. We're gonna check on our baklava. It's puffing, it's working, we're gonna keep going though. Okay, so this is done. Now, I am going to get a pan out. And we're going to do our meat. And hopefully, by the time we're done rolling the meat, the baklava will be done. So then I can show you 
the how to put the syrup on and you can hear the sizzle. But I'll let you know when the sizzle is so you can be really, really quiet so you can hear the sizzle because the sizzle is one of the best parts. All right, do that here. We've got this over here. I may need to get more eggs, but we'll figure that out afterwards. All right, where's my butter? So I can butter my thing. Here it is. All right, I'm just gonna butter my tray so things don't stick because that makes me grumpy. There we go. All right, we ready? We're gonna roll these little little meat filled roses. All right, here we go. It's the same thing, only instead of creating a big big spiral, we're just gonna do individual ones. Now, the nice thing about these is that if you wanted to, you could make all of these and then you could just flash freeze them and then you could take them off and put them in individual packages and you could freeze them and then you could take them out and then you could um, you could cook them when you're ready. Let's see, could you use a seed you're not allergic to? Um, I, as far as nuts and seeds, you can, you can use whatever stuff you want as far as baklava. Um, I've used, uh, there are, most people are allergic to walnuts. So I try to be aware of that. Some people are allergic to almonds. And what I've realized is that people who have a nut allergy are allergic to, I call them top down nuts. They grow on a tree and fall to the ground. This is my own little term. And that, but they're not allergic to seeds. So they're not allergic to sunflower seeds. They're not allergic to pumpkin seeds or hemp seeds or chia seeds. So what I do for people who have nut allergies or don't know if someone has a nut allergy, I use, see, we're just spiraling it, okay? When it's already in a big spiral, I'm going to put that there. i got to tilt that down. So um, I will do, I call it bird seed baklava, where I'll take three cups equivalent of different seeds. And I put that in the food processor with the cinnamon and sugar, and then I um, I make it that way. And honestly, there, there really isn't, I mean, you can tell there's a texture that's different. There's a color that's different of the nuts. And there's a roasting flavor, you know, because the seeds cook up differently than the nuts as far as flavor. But people have been fine with that. You know, if you have an allergy to a nut or you want to make something that you know is not going to be an allergy potentiality for someone if you're having a party. You can just make it with seeds. That's what makes using baklava, like, it's it can be whatever you want it to be. You can just think outside the box. I usually do a combination of hemp seeds, chia seeds, sunflower seeds, and pumpkin seeds. That's what I usually do. And I call it bird seed baklava because it kind of reminds me of bird seed. I pull it back. Okay. And I always roll it while it's sitting because it's easier to pick it up. See, it's easier to pick it up. And I try to get the, the seam. I don't know if you can tell, but I try to get the seam at the edge of the pan so that it will stay shut. Once these are cooked, you can either let them cool and freeze them. So that's the other nice thing about making these individual burdocks is that they are also, fro you can freeze them before you cook them and you can freeze them after you cook them. Okay. Add some more. I tend to overstuff mine. Again, as you can see, I'm not really measuring. I'm just kind of grabbing and putting some stuff on there. Just making a line, can you see that? And there's going to come a time where it's going to get to, it, your burrack might split, your burrack dough might stick. So I'm not, this we are very lucky to have very nice, happy, happy dough. Understand it's crapshoot, you never know what you're gonna get. It is not a box of chocolates, it could be a pissy bag of dough. I think we are going to time this perfect where 
everything is going to go in the oven and out of the oven at the same time. And I think we're just going to even up super nice, which is going to be make my heart so happy. All right. We only have one more sheet after this. All right. I try to leave a little bit at the edge where there's nothing because it will just fall out the end. And then that will make me grumpy. There we go. It's the second to last one. So I got what? Five. Oh, see? My thing split. It's all good though. We're just gonna pull it back gently. It's probably gonna break. Just test your patience a bit, but it'll be okay. Oh, I gotta turn off my burner. My butter burner is still on. I gotta turn that off. All right, this one, because I know it's split in the middle, I'm gonna go slow. There's a split right here in the dough, because as you can see, it was folded. I don't know if you can tell that or not from the side, but it was folded, which makes it a little bit more brittle. So I'm gonna go slow. See, it split again. Okay, see, it's okay, even I split it, it's all good. And I stick that edge right up against the other one. And I'm gonna open this up a little bit. And I still have a split. Okay. Oh well, look, we're gonna have just enough egg and milk. The only thing I don't like about this is that it does not have that nice um, long piece of plastic wrap that goes the length of the dough. So like now half of it is on the plastic wrap and half of it is on my counter. So sometimes that sticks. So it becomes a little bit tricky. Oh, we actually went through most of it. I don't have much meat left over. Well, yay me. I didn't know that. Okay. We're gonna go slow because one, it's split or is about to split and it's splitting. And it's stuck, did you see? Can you see it's stuck? You just pull it off. The last one is always really tricky and that's okay. And we're stuck. So I'm gonna take, sorry, that is my crazy dog. See? This is called the end of the dough. So I fold it back this way because sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do. Okay? And you just hope for the best. All right, we're gonna go slow. This is the last one. It's always a little tricky. You just kind of let it go however it needs to go. Ah, I did split up, ah! Do you see? This is how dough gets pissy. It gets freaking pissy. Do you see? It's fine. You just kind of push it back together and you put it in your pan and then you add more stuff to it and it will cook up just fine. This is why I think a lot of people are afraid of working with phyllo dough is because it is not always the easiest thing to work with. So I am going to take my um, my isot again. Where's my thing, my tray? Where's my tray? And I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of the isots and the hot, of the hot pepper, that roasted paprika on the top. Normally I do sesame seeds, but I didn't have them. So we're just going to go with what we have. So I'm just gonna put some hot pepper flakes on top. All right, I'm gonna wait for an oven to open. I'm going to turn it this way and I'm going to turn this burner off because that is done. And then that over here. All right, now getting ready for the baklava to come out. Um, we don't need a green onion in my baklava syrup. So let's just, that's yummy. So 
with the baklava syrup, you've made, hopefully ahead of time, it's nice and cool. It doesn't need to be cold, cold, but at least needs to be cooled overnight. And um, let's see, uh, what was I saying? I don't use all of the syrup. So mom uses, and a lot of people use the full three cups of, of syrup because we had three cups of sugar, one and a half cups of water, and a tablespoon of lemon juice. And that makes about two and a half to two and three quarters cups of syrup. I don't like my baklava drowning in syrup. I like to have that flavor texture that I talked about where um, there's uh, the, um, the crunch and the goo. That's what I like. Uh, it's very technical, the goo. But um, I don't like to. I only use a cup and a half. So I've measured out a cup and a half of my syrup. I'm going to get a cooling rack. I'm going to check my baklava. Oh, look, it's done. We timed it right. This is so fun. Okay. So here we go. Okay. See? Look, we got baklava. So we're going to put that there. We're going to put this in the bottom of it. And now we're going to adjust this so you can see. All right, don't mind all the crazy stuff there. So what I do is you don't just pour it over the top. You go down in the corners. And then I go around the outside. This is my little OCD-ness of syrup. And then I go up and down. Can you hear it? And that's it. Ta-da! Now baklava is the kind of pastry you can't really eat right away because what needs to happen is it needs to cool and it needs to absorb all of the syrup and all of the layers. So when people ask me like, well, can you make this tomorrow and can I have it today? And I'm like, no, you, it's really hard to do same day cooking and delivery or same day cooking and eating because it really should at the best, you know, idea is, is to sit for 24 hours because that way it fully absorbs it fully cools and it slightly dehydrates a little bit so you don't have this gooey gooey stuff you know one of the things that i don't like is i don't like to, if i put them in the muffin papers that the syrup makes it all sticky so i don't like that so i like it to have the opportunity to set and rest and that's why when people ask for it i'm like well you can get that in two days because i need to be able to make it and then it needs to sit and then I package it. So baklava is not that kind of thing that you can make the day of. It's always better the second day. The other thing is that I do not put baklava in the refrigerator to stay fresh. It does not need it. Um, in my opinion, it makes it drier and it dehydrates it. And again, I don't know the science, but it fades it. So when you put it into the refrigerator to keep, you know, to stay longer, it actually makes the phyllo dough fade and it looks sad and it looks like all unhappy and stuff and we don't want unhappy baklava. So what I suggest is I you can take, where's my thing? Hold on, let's shake out the crumbles. But you have this nice plastic wrap, plastic that came with the phyllo dough. Once this has cooled and you wanna keep it fresh, you can just place this over it. See, this is why I like that box of phyllo dough because the plastic wrap has mul multiple purposes because I like to reuse things. So that's that. Let's check on our burek. I don't know if it's done yet. Nope, it is not done yet. All right, I think your guys are good for right now. You're gonna keep your burek in the oven until it's brown. So probably another 20 minutes. So if you were here, I put on a pot of tea and coffee. Since you're not here, I can't do that. So I'm going to say goodbye for right now and thank you for coming and playing with me this morning. And hopefully, hopefully, may we can actually all sit down together in my new space.
because that would be pretty damn awesome. Anyway, that's it for me for today. I will talk to you later. Goodbye.